data is with a unified namespace commoditized. It's easily accessible for users, for use cases. And with the unified namespace, you decouple applications because data is one, but application is theoretically replaceable. You're listening to Augmented Ops, where manufacturing meets innovation. We highlight the transformative ideas and technologies shaping the front lines of operations, helping you stay ahead of the curve in the rapidly evolving world of industrial tech. Here's your host, Natan Linder, CEO and co-founder of Tulip, the frontline operations platform. All right. Today on Augmented Ops, we're chatting with the co-founder of United Manufacturing Hub, UMH, Alex Kruger. We're going to explore our open source infrastructure meets operational technology stacks. As you know, open source software is something that we really can't live without. It serves basically as the foundation of most of the digital products around us, and we interact with it day to day. However, for manufacturing industry, we're still very much in the early days. Alex will explain to us why this needs to change and how his team are working to define a new type of stack to build a unified namespace architecture for manufacturing. Let's go. Alex, welcome to Augmented Ops. It's a pleasure to have you on the show and talk about open source and manufacturing. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. So Alex Kruger, for those of you who don't know, We'll go deep into his own introduction and journey in a second here. Is the co-founder CEO of United Manufacturing Hub. This sounds between a rebel movement, a football team, and a coolest industrial operation company out of Germany, all combined in one. What is it? So first, I think we can stick with UMH. I think yeah. United Manufacturing Hub. I think we had to chose a quite long name, but. We try to be a middle layer in all industrial operations now and looking forward because we see there's so much data produced in factories at the moment. So there mm -hmm. is inside PLCs, it's sensors like talking in pharma and discrete and also energy. And you have now even more interesting use cases popping up that could make use of the data. So talking tulip, large scale analytics, or just simple dashboarding, we could make use of the data. And then not just talking now, but also later AI what you could also do then. But the data is not going there. Like it's not going easily to the applications where it's needed. Mm -hmm. And we try to be the middle layer, the unified namespace plus more to make sure that you can at scale, get all the data and push it to the applications and also make it scalable from an architecture perspective. So we are quite technical mm -hmm. and try to break it down easily. Awesome. So we will dive into more technical details. And I think, you know, that's the nice thing about augmented ops. Like we can span different types of audiences that are interested to look at the real challenges of, you know, bringing operations and manufacturing to this era, you know, everything is cloud, everything is AI, etc. And mm. yeah, doing it is actually harder than it sounds. So we'll dive into that in a second. But before that, how did you get to UMH from an early career as a system integrator, you know, working with consulting firms like McKinsey on shop floors? How does that informed what UMH is actually becoming? good take on it's harder than you think actually we started with the, with the hard part so we were like straight out of university back then mm -hmm. we had the opportunity with McKinsey to tackle a joint project so they took digital manufacturing or like a smart manufacturing however you call it and McKinsey great on people and processes change management all the stuff but they were digital manufacturing or smart manufacturing really makes up is a technical component which is hard to deliver. And we were like two technical guys back then, Jeremy and me. We we're up to the challenge. And McKinsey came to you and asked you to do what? Connect all the shop floor assets to, for example, do an OEE analysis back uh -huh. then. So it was like they got an, a project and part of it was like digital performance management, for example. Mm -hmm. But even five, six years ago, yeah. there were like a bunch of tools that, you know, you could call the machine monitoring and connect that, get a dashboard, like, what's the problem? Mm. Like, why did they need you? So this is the nitty gritty details. Like, so you had, also back then you had like this vision of Syngworks, Mindsphere, right. like all these tools who right. are saying, we are everything you need. Just buy us, mm -hmm. no problems anymore. Mm -hmm. And like with this perspective, we were then the ones getting these tools and just do guys. It cannot and be and that you're hard. like, Mindsphere doesn't work. 
<laughs> it's like you have now this cloud application and you have now like 20 year old machines and how do you now combine that and it was like oh we need a middle layer we need protocol converters or oh, what is when the internet connection is going out we need some buffering in there uh -huh. or oh, we need also a database and oh and it adds up and adds up and then more and more edge cases pop up and at some point you're like building an own system in between and this was how we leveraged ourselves building the united manufacturing hub as a side project if you want so yeah mm -hmm. so from that early experience then how did that evolve into umh so for us we like just needed a tooling to keep up with mckinsey pace because uh -huh. like because they two were weeks fast and, yeah yeah and they expect fast results okay now we have like two weeks and after the two weeks all machines are connected and everything is there not possible on normal pace if you not work then 18 hours a day which we did but we needed a tool before to like make sure that everything that we do is super super well put into place and then we connected for example first film was heavy industries where we like steel cutting blasting then we connected all the machines with sensors etc and provisioned also hardware because we needed edge devices to fetch all the data and forward the data to the cloud And this was on where we put the United Manufacturing Hub in place and then new problems came up. For example, now I need not one edge device, but 20. But like installing 20 edge devices for two guys is like a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, and we just build a tool to automatically deploy all the services on one tool, make it versionable because we were the guys getting called when something does not work. Yeah. And we want to minimize that amount of calls that we got. Mm -hmm. So we put in like alerting, infrastructure tests, etc. against that infrastructure. And this is how we then evolve from like an architecture integration to more product because we need to standardize mm -hmm. all our integration efforts. Yeah. So you were on a integration set of requirements and journey and a yeah. product came out. And I think what's cool about this story is that you were like two young guys out of university and you had to do all this work and you had a lot of choice, right? Yeah. I guess McKinsey and the other early customers were like, okay, we just need this to work. They, they didn't really care exactly what you choose to do it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about those early choices because I think those will inform the, the next set of big ideas that we should tackle here around, yeah. for example, open source for manufacturing. So what choices did you make? What tools did you pick with Jeremy to build the first uh, UMH implementations? To quote Jeremy J, he was massively frustrated with the tools that you could buy. Mm -hmm. It was back then you could buy OPC UA converters, S7 converters, uh -huh. edge devices from reputable brands in Europe and in the US. Yeah. But the tools were at some time inferior and there were so much good tools already out there. So talking open source, there was no dread. But, but the price was okay, right? Uh, the price was never the issue. I, <laughs> <laughs> I shared the same sentiment on, you know, those converters yeah. and all these. But on top of all of that, not only they're inferior and complex and honestly, in times, bad software, mm. they're also so expensive and like this premium, like, for example, I can't stand it. You need like a, an embedded computer, which is just a computer. But if the word industrial is before the PC, suddenly the price is like 20% or 30% yeah. higher and it's nuts, you know? Sometimes you need IP65, but come on, you know? Yeah, yeah such random certifications yeah. stamp onto it and then price double, triple. Yeah. And the problem also, especially on the software side was we needed to move fast because projects making the high pressure. Yeah. And then now we need to buy something and try to buy something in an industrial context weeks, months before you have the product in hand. Yeah. And then try to find good documentation because you have a problem. Oh, now you need to text somebody. He comes back to you three business days later and sends you a random PDF, but on open source. So now it shows not red, for example, for connectivity back then. You mm -hmm. have YouTube videos. You have like communities actively discussing and also some random guy in Brazil, for example, outside of all business hours, inside theirs, is just there to help. It's like so more traction on those tools, so better experience. And there was like, no second thought about going closed source on the commodity tools. Yeah. yeah. So obviously we share the same point of view and I believe passion towards like what the open source movement needs to do for technology in general and certainly for operations and manufacturing. But I'm kind of curious about your perspective, but with Tulip and, you know, we're thinking about this from the lens of the continuous improvement person on the line, operational mm. excellence, but also the control engineer and the IT, OT architect, you know, there's many titles in, in sort of where we roam. You go there, often they know about the open source tools, but you know, if you try and compare how they're used and adopted within operations manufacturing compared to any other engineering field you know, that makes mm -hmm. hardware, software, what have you, there's no comparison. It's like 
Zero point one percent to like ninety nine percent, I think. Or I don't know. Why is that, and how are we changing it? I think it's just on a speed thingy. So I think OT. So if you compare how to choose and design systems in either IT or OT, in IT is all about user experience, moving fast, scalable data infrastructure. You need to handle millions of users or trillions of data points per second, whatever. And OT is actually only about having something that works and is reliable and you can just install and let it run for 20 years. So there is no need for moving fast. But hold on, is it actually true nowadays? In the infrastructure perspective, I would I would add. Yeah. But I think generally speaking, sure, when you build up a value stream that needs to run 24-7 for the next 20 years, so to speak, though I don't I don't actually know a lot of them. I saw some statistic, I forget the source, that the mean time of a value stream is like five to seven years or something like that. Of yeah. course, there's some industries that go for longer, but because there's reconfiguration, new product, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I feel like that's a little bit of what people say about infrastructure because that it kind of gives you a pass not to do continuous improvement on the infrastructure level. And I just don't believe it because technology cycles, even on automation setups, are they're still affected. I think they're moving. But if you just look at the... I think application is moving faster. Mm -hmm. uh, so MES is now being microservice-based architectures uh, away from monolithic. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, for example, uh, controllers yep. or like SCADA systems, DCS systems, everything is still based on Windows XP, for example, because oh it was certified God. in 2013 or whatever to, to run in this scenario. That's concerning. <laughs> Windows it XP. is, it is. <laughs> and this is also why they lock it away. It's like, oh, we have definitely a lot of vulnerabilities in our infrastructure and we yeah. cannot afford to let the internet in. And this is then also what hinders innovation. IT is blocking security okay. arguments. So how are we fixing that? What is UMH approach mm -hmm. and how does it relate to this idea behind the unified namespace architecture that, you know, I think yeah. everyone is still learning a lot on it in our circles, which we roam. Mm -hmm. And there are different takes on what it is and what it's not. And so I'm kind of curious to get your take on two things. Like one, yeah. how do you see unified namespace? Well, first define it in your own words. Then why <laughs> is it different than the traditional way of thinking about ISO 95, Purdue models? Yeah. And is this hype or is this actually good benefits for manufacturers? Is there a real value in this approach? Yeah. In my words, quite technically, it's an event-driven architecture. And this mm -hmm. is from that it's not a hype, it's already best practice in IT data streaming. So if you now mm -hmm. design an R&D organization, sales, logistics, whatever, you would have like this Kafka broker in the middle and stream data through it. And the unified yeah. namespace is a new term of making this applicable for engineering. This is also where Walker, I'm not sure if he coined it, but he made the concept more accessible for people who have no idea what event-driven architecture is because mm -hmm. it's IT, it's theoretic, and now it's super tangible also for engineers to absorb. Walker by far educated more people yeah. on the internet on what unified namespace is and promoted the core principles and has a lot of great contributions to yeah. people understanding how to put it practically in use. And I, I kind of agree. Yeah, event-driven architectures have been around for decades. But talk to me about how is it different than ISO 95 in your view? So also technical, ISO 95 is from ETL, like extract, transform, load in the yeah. IT terms to get something from one layer, transform, and perhaps destroy some information and push it to the next one. So architecturally super different, but I think far more important is it's a different mindset on how you access data. Data is with a unified namespace, commoditized. It's easily accessible for users, for use cases. And from there on, you also a little bit attack of the traditional vertically integrated um, systems in manufacturing. So you buy from this manufacturer the PLC, so you need to buy the scalar system from the same one. You also add now the historian functionality from this one, okay. et cetera, et cetera. And with the unified namespace, you decouple applications because data is one, but application is theoretically replaceable. And for there, you can just pick and place components around this unified namespace. Right. I think that you're hitting on the key point because all that sort of modularity, clear interfaces, event-driven, and may I add PubSub? Yep. You want to explain PubSub for our less technical audience in layman terms for a second? When, why is that important to have a PubSub yep. architecture? I'm not sure if I can do it in simple terms. No, it's okay. We'll include some references, but we are two nerds. We are two engineers, and augmented ops can also get nerdy. So message broker PubSub, 
if you like running Reuters, like the message agency, yep. for example, and you now get reports from all people now reporting on Africa, on South America, and in Asia, and you now have people in Europe interested in Africa. So you and you have people also in North America interested in Africa. Somebody can publish messages on Africa and everybody in Europe and who's before interested in such informations from Reuters can subscribe to those uh, streams and they automatically get redirected the message from where it comes from. This is the same for PLC's information or order yep. information that different applications can want to have. Yep. Again, this is where we've been pushing the open source use, whether it's OPC UA or, you know, MQTT is built into Tulip. OPC mm. UA servers are built into Tulip. We have Node-RED is built into our Edge device. All, all of that. Yeah. What I'm seeing customers are doing and what it helps them think about their architectures as open, evolving environments where they can mix and match different systems. And like, you know, everybody's kind of have different ways to talk about this, but like the welding of the IT and OT. Because, you know, you mm. said before, this is changing the historian perspective because you're going to have to go through, okay, you got you got the data from this PLC, but for one company, uh, they need to put it in Snowflake and another one needs to just put it in some local mm. copy of an SQL server because maybe it's aerospace defense. And that flexibility, yeah. that's what customers are buying. And it's also in a way they're buying future-proofing because, you know, IT people have been doing this for decades. Of course, stuff improved yeah. and so on, but... I don't know. The origins of MQTT is not like the past three years. <laughs> you know, it's been around for a while. <laughs> so where is this going? Like, tell me, like, okay, you're so you're in the forefront of this. And, you know, obviously followed all the great templates, and you know, you have a great uh, knowledge base and community that I've been Thanks, um, yeah. nerding out on. Great stuff. If you go to UMH Docs yeah. as a resources. So from where you're seeing it, what's the future of open source and operations? What's mm. what's the stuff everybody should be tuning into? First, it's knowledge. This is also where you and we are like quite heavily pushing on because before OT can apply a lot of those technologies, I think we need to create this common ground on names, technology, architecture types. As soon as we have that, the unified namespace could be like this coupling in between OT and IT and also unblock these situations where IT is forbidding innovation. So this was also a perceived reality. I see when I talk to a lot of OT people, IT forbids me to publish data there. Um, they forbid me to install edge devices here and there. And as soon as they speak the same language as IT, understands the principles and have the unified namespace as a connecting piece to, for example, push all their SCADA or like all their PLC data into Tulip to build a better application and make it even then secure, et cetera, so the IT is happy. I think this could fuel a lot of innovation and make it way cheaper to innovate also. Mm-hmm. You know, we like to give our listeners some practical stuff. If you have to list like mm. the five most important open source things to look at that operations people should know and understand. So we, we named one like Node-RED. What else? Let's get really specific. What else would you recommend? Well, I think I would actually also to really deep dive into like the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. How does networking work? Like, okay, this sounds also stupid and easy. You have cables and IP addresses and ports. Yeah. But what are the transport mechanisms in there? What like the advantages of UDP, TCP, um, mm -hmm. a trace route, so that you can speak the same language? The same goes also for databases. I see a lot of confusion on databases mm -hmm. because the difference between OLAP and OLTP, some databases are there for a routine transaction, like an uh, SQL database. Yep. I'm a shop and uh, now I sell two bananas, so please delete two bananas from my inventory versus like a snowflake where you push all your data and then once a month run a three hour query against it. And if you now have this right, you can also get to good discussions. The same goes for how to connect building blocks together. Mm -hmm. So this was also back then a super hard confusion on Thingworks because Thingworks, or don't want to rant about too hard, but they publish them as this building block in the middle where you connect everything to. Mm -hmm. But architecturally, it's like a database-ish approach, but you cannot connect real-time use cases with a database. So mm -hmm. what's the advantage of communicating point-to-point, -point, database, message broker? I mm -hmm. think getting those fundamentals right and then go into SQL database, go to Node-RED, go to MQTT, go to Kafka. Mm -hmm. And there's so much great content out there that you could just digest and also perhaps build some cool dashboards in Grafana. Yeah. Grafana is getting better all the time, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. I think... So they even add more visual stuff that's important to uh, manufacturing companies. I think they added also this canvas feature. I think it's built actually for IT observability, but you could just also draw like your line there and put like temperature uh, throughput OE on there. 
and it's so ridiculously stable. It's built for enterprise IT environments and yeah. you can just get it for free in the sense of yeah. it's a great tooling. That's a good wrap on that. You know, we went in and out of depth on the open source stuff and tech. But really, if you zoom out, so much scale and complexity is handled by this mm. open source infrastructure, whether it's like the Linux operating system, the mm. Grafana, the cPanels, the, Kubernetes, whole, yeah. the Kubernetes, of course, and all this sort of stuff that honestly we're taking more and more for granted the past few years because you know when kubernetes introduced i want to say it's coming on a decade plus like from the beginning mm -hmm. but it's it's not that old you know no but in technology terms it's like established and uh, yeah, a huge community yeah. and uh, great tooling and that's not going away because it supports the internet it supports mm -hmm. any data center that runs today and to think that that's not going to run operations is just nuts yeah. it's just ludicrous but you know what's interesting in the few minutes that we have left, and we'll do it like a quick fire round because we have to wrap up mm -hmm. pretty soon. So, okay, we agree on the open source infrastructure, all that kind of stuff. But now, how do you think it applies to the higher level application? So I have two questions, yep. two products. How do you think all this is changing historians in the traditional sense? Because historians are kind of like, I'm trying to figure out what the hell is a historian anymore. <laughs> so that's question <laughs> one. And then I have a provocative one, which is, if you take UMH plus two, are we getting to the promised land if it's at all a promised land of headless MESs? Mm -hmm. You know, yep. not just composable, like, you know, two composable next gen MES. And you said MES is becoming more microservice, which I'm not sure I fully agree. I mean, I'll believe it when mm -hmm. I really see it. <laughs> 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 but you know what I mean? So let's start with the historian. So where are historians going? I think they will be here for another 20 years because they're too deeply embedded, especially in the GXP field. Mm -hmm. Because certifications, requirements make sure that they are there because they are fully validated, etc. But wait, why can't they use UMH and Snowflake? Isn't that uh, you can't validate that? What's the problem? Because if they use Snowflake or like an open source tool like UMH, I think it will take a few years to penetrate in the complete market. Uh -huh. And like those systems, especially in the pharma context, will still run then once they're there at least 15, 20 years. So I think in that period, they're still relevant. Mm -hmm. But I think they don't solve a problem anymore. They come yeah. from a time where like data was expensive, storage was expensive, and databases are not that good in compression. So they developed their own algorithms like swing door, et cetera, and sampled down data. Mm. But now eight terabyte hard drive costs, I don't know, $40. This is ridiculously inexpensive. And then also storing in S3 cold storage, it's like zero dot nine zeros and then uh, one cent per gigabyte per month. So it's they don't solve a problem anymore because it's already been solved by progress in IT. So first of all, I kind of agree and disagree because I think mm. 15, 20 years is a long time, even for GXP. I mean, our journey yeah. in GXP, people told us, oh, you know, you'll never be able to run uh, pharmaceutical for manufacturing in the cloud and uh, it's hard to validate and all this kind of continuous delivery mm. and FDA don't go together. And I was like, well, not, not really. You know, we've been audited. We're running, you know, thousands of station and production in GXP environments and it's all running from the cloud and it's all, you know, has SLAs and uh, zero RPO redundancy and that's only possible from the cloud and so on. And, you know, we, we don't think about us as a historian, but we definitely collect a lot of data at the source and, and contextualize yeah. it. And we obviously ship it to many other types of systems. So I'm seeing a little bit of a different trend and I think a lot can happen in 15 years. But mm. that's one reason I disagree. The second reason I disagree is I don't think everybody thinks about the needs and requirements of a historian with a GXP level. I think a lot of mm, when we yeah, say sure. historian is like, well, maybe this part we do agree. Like giving my data anywhere, if I need it, I'm, I'm okay to wait like yeah. two, even two minutes or 10 minutes fetching it from cold storage, which costs me nothing. And I actually don't want it in a data center somewhere in an air conditioned room in the factory because only Johnny has the key. And when Johnny is sick, uh, I don't have my data. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's my point of view on historian. I, I think that space yeah. is, we should really watch it carefully. And th there's a lot happening there that is uh, super, yeah. super cool. Yeah. I hope I'm wrong. So I hope it, it goes faster. I think you're wrong because you'll have a big business terraforming historians if you keep going. Um, <laughs> okay. And now to the last. And not less exciting question, what is your take on headless MES? So we also get requested from large industrial companies who want to slice down the MES because it likes this ridiculously large monolithic application who uh -huh. has no clear definition. Oh my God. For Are you saying they're not satisfied with their MES? 
<laughs> I'm saying that I think it's, it's not maintainable. It's not usable anymore. Like I think it will be sliced down. So it will be stripped down to core functionalities, planning, scheduling, orders, pushing to the shop floor. And then I think it will be then microservice based. I would agree it's not not fully there. And I actually also don't, didn't see it at scale. Yeah. But I think this is the way to go because now everybody's rebuilding the MES and really want to make sure this functionality, for example, interaction with the worker. Oh, let's use Tulip therefore because they are the perfect gateway to interact with the persons on, on site. Yeah. Then they need another tool perhaps for AI optimized scheduling, whatever. But they want to have this flexibility. And then I see UNS in the middle yeah. as connecting all the dots there. Yeah on data operations and backbone to have an architecture that is scalable and using future-proof open source tools. So Alex, this has been quite a ride. Thanks. I think we should do it again. We'll find more cool topics. So we're going to include some of the references for a lot of the technical mambo jumbo that uh, two nerd engineers were going on here yep. today. So with that, we say goodbye and we will see you again soon. Thank you so much for joining. Appreciate it. And uh, You know, like in the open source fashion, you know, you should like uh, post a lot and so mm -hmm. we can fork your stuff and uh, <laughs> <laughs> contribute it back to the community Take and it. Yeah. reuse it and build a better operation stack for all our stakeholders. So important. Thanks a lot, Alex. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Augmented Ops Podcast from Tulip Interfaces. We hope you found this week's episode informative and inspiring. You can find the show on LinkedIn and YouTube or at tulip.co slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating or review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time.